we're living in a season that we must know the voice of the Lord, which is the Holy Spirit. I don't believe in happenstance. I believe in the Holy Spirit. You've got to divinely walk in the Spirit of God if you want to be effective in this work. The compassion of God that changes people's lives. The love. that tells me is we can walk with God through the church all of our lives and not recognize Jesus, not recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit. We have to work at that relationship, listening, learning the sound, learning the feeling of the Spirit of God versus the world system. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today and what I want us to get into the place of practice even. We're going to, this is not a church service. This is more like a school, okay? We got on the elevator last night and there was a, a, I won't call them a gang, but it was a big um, team. It was a big team of uh, some kind of school, some college, lots of boys there. And one of the boys got on the elevator with us and he had a cross on. And I said, do you wear that cross because of your covenant or do you wear that cross because it's popular? And he said, oh, Jesus and me, we like this. <laughs> I said, Jesus and me like this too. I said, that's why I asked you because I wanted to make sure you weren't just wearing a sign and didn't have a change. He said, oh no, I have a heart change that's brought me to the ability to wear this cross. And so that's why we have to be the church we are the church when we leave out of here, and God is constantly giving us opportunities to say something. You know that old statement ever since 9-11, if you see something, say something? Well, I say, if you hear something, make sure you say it, because God wants to talk through us. Let's start with um, Romans six thirteen. Worship is intercession, and intercession is worship. They're not two different things. If people say, oh, I, I, I love to worship, but I can't pray. No. If you're a worshiper, you can pray. If you're a prayer warrior, you can worship. Because it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. One may have a melody, and the other may not. But it's both being God's instrument. So at Romans 6.13... We start with this, and only because I want you to learn how to yield your instrument. I am reading out the Amplified Bible. Romans 6.13 says, Do not continue offering or yielding your bodily members, your faculties, to sin as instruments or tools. Now, that word there in the Hebrew and then the Aramaic, which it was originally written in, and then the Greek, is actually weapons. So instrument or tools or weapons are the same words. So when you're worshiping God, you're a weapon. Hello. When you are interceding and praying, you're a weapon in the hand of God. So he says, don't continue yielding your instrument or your weapon. Don't yield your instrument to wickedness. But offer and yield yourselves to God as though you've been raised from the dead. How many of you can say, I've been raised from the dead? I've been raised from the dead. And I've been raised to life. And I offer my bodily members and faculties to God, presenting them as instruments implements, tools, or weapons of righteousness. And that righteousness comes not because we earn it, but because Jesus gave it to us. It's a gift. We receive it, and we walk in it every day of our lives from the day we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We do the divine exchange. He takes all my wickedness, and I take all his righteousness, and I wear his robe of righteousness all through eternity, and I start on the earth. And so that is a gift that I receive. I don't earn it, but I keep it by walking in the Spirit of God and that right standing with God, that righteousness of God. I'm in right standing with God, so I have a right to wear the robe. So this is an instrument. It makes sound. This is an instrument. I didn't even try it out, and I should have. It makes sound. 
It makes sound. It's an instrument. It did not play itself. In fact, as I was walking toward it, it didn't start protesting. It didn't start going, oh, not me today. Play the drums. It didn't say, oh, play the guitar today. Don't, don't play me. I'm having a bad hair day. Did it? it, did, it did it do any kind of negative response? The instrument simply yielded. Amen. You are the instrument. When the Holy Spirit asks to play you, do you yield? Now, here's what's amazing about an instrument. This has a sound. You have a sound. Many times we try to disqualify our instrument by saying that my instrument doesn't sound as good as somebody else's. But that's not my right to do because... God made you as the instrument that you are. He pitched you, he toned you, he frequenced you, and he may have to tune you on a regular basis through the word, through the spirit, through prayer, and you still may not like your sound. And you know what? If you don't, you're, you're in a big group. Most people don't like their own sound. The devil starts very early in your life telling you you're not good enough, your voice isn't good enough, let somebody else do it. But the truth is you've been frequenced, tuned, sounded to the sound that you have and then placed in a position on the earth to bring down a demonic stronghold in your area. So when you are silent, then the stronghold stays in place because you're disqualifying your sound. Everybody's not going to be first chair violin in God's orchestra. In fact, an orchestra with only first chair violin would be very dull. You wouldn't want to listen very long. We need the kettle drum. We need the cymbal, right? Somebody's got to play the piccolo, <laughs> right? I think it's Josh's second daughter with her little high voice. <laughs> She's the piccolo in God's in instruments. Some people are the trumpet, Others are the oboe. And any one of these instruments by themselves don't sound that great. But you put them in the orchestra. And the conductor begins to play. And your sound matters. For if you withhold your sound, there's going to be a demonic stronghold that stays in position simply because you were silent when you should have been sounding. So... One of the things you'll find in any schools that the Holy Spirit is directing is the first thing you're going to have to learn is how to get over yourself, right? You have to get over not liking the way you sound. You have to get over being embarrassed. You know what embarrassed tells me? You're still all about you. People say, oh, but I feel terrible about myself. Yes, but you're still feeling about you. Whether you're all proud as a peacock or poor me, poor me, it's still me. So it's all pride. Even the, I can't do anything, don't look at me, pride. Right. I mean, when the enemy tries to mask things and say, oh, look how humble they are. That's not humble. The only way you're humble is when it's all about him. When it's all about him and nothing about you, that's humble. When all the glory is being shifted to him, even all of my insecurities, I, shift, I did the divine exchange. I shifted all of my insecurities to him. I am secure in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If pastor says, so-and-so pray, you just jump up and pray. You don't think. You don't question. It's not about you anyway. If you say, I can't pray, that's right, you can't. We're asking the Holy Ghost to pray through you. We hope you don't pray. Because if you pray, it's going to be dull and powerless and empty and of no effect. But if the Holy Spirit is playing your instrument, it's glorious. For depending upon who plays it, I could ask everybody on this front row to go up there and play that keyboard. And it would sound different with each hand, wouldn't it? 
How about if I asked you to go play? What would it sound like? Can you play? Okay, go up there and play it. I would ask Martha, but I know she can play. Go up there and just play that. You actually did pretty good. I'm surprised. <laughs> okay, so let me just ask you. Did this still sound like a piano or a keyboard? Absolutely. But the sound of it changed depending on who's playing it. The power of it changed, right? But still sounds like a keyboard, right? But if I play... The instrument's always going to sound like the instrument. But depending on who's playing it, changes. You know who's playing the instrument by the sound that's coming out of it. So when the Holy Spirit is praying you, you sound a certain way. When the devil's playing you, don't yield your instrument to wickedness, you sound a certain way. When flesh is playing your instrument, you sound a certain way. Still, still same instrument, but depending on who you yield to, I've, I've heard people actually laugh and say, ah, oh, forget what I just said. That was just the devil. Like it's okay. It is not okay to yield to the devil. It is not okay to sound like the world. It is not okay to let flesh come out of our mouths. It's not okay because Jesus owns us. He owns our instrument and he should own our sound. But he loves us so much, he gives us the ability to yield our instrument even after he owns us to whoever we allow to play us that is the sound coming out of us. So with that in mind, you're going to start thinking about how you sound. What comes out of your mouth. My mom just had her 90th birthday. Her oldest sister uh, just last month went on to heaven. She was 99, just six weeks shy of her 100th birthday. But when my mother's sister turned about 90, my mom, I've talked to my mom every day on the phone, my mom would say to me, now when I start sounding like your Aunt Georgie, I want you to tell me. Because as she got older, instead of getting sweeter, she got more negative. So my mom said to me, if I ever start sounding like her, I want you to tell me. And so about three weeks ago, <laughs> She was on a rampage one day when I was talking to her, and I said, remember you asking me to tell you when you begin to sound like my Aunt Georgie? And she said, don't tell me. <laughs> I said, well, you did ask, so all I'm saying is, she said, don't tell me. I said, all I'm saying is, she said, I get it. You see, what happens is if we're not careful, we get used to it. We don't just automatically yield to the sound of the devil. We just don't automatically yield to flesh. We just do it little by little by little. And sometimes if you're around a certain talk, you'll pick it up. Sometimes People say that they're, if they're around me very long, they start talking southern. Who was it came in this morning and says, how's your mom and them? There you go. <laughs> you just kind of pick it up. So when you hang with people that are godly, you start picking up the godly talk. But if you hang with the world or you work with the world, and sometimes you do work with the world, you've got to be louder than them so that you influence them more than they influence you. You have to be the voice. You can't be, oh, I'll just be quiet about it. No, no. You've got to be louder than them. You got to be worshiping at your desk. You got to be praying in the Holy Ghost. If they if they hear you, you're just they say, "Oh, you're talking to me." No, no, Holy Spirit's talking through me. Is he talking to you? 
You have to stir up the gift of God. Look at um, 1 Timothy. Timothy was in training. I'm just following the Holy Ghost this morning. Timothy was in training, and Paul was his mentor. And Paul told him, he said, listen, I know you're young. I know you're a young pastor. Actually, it's uh, 2 Timothy. I want to start with verse 6, chapter 1. This is Paul talking to Timothy. He said, that's why I would remind you to stir up, rekindle the embers, fan the flame, and keep burning the gracious gift of God, the inner fire that is in you by means of the laying on of my hands with those of the elders at your ordination. So what does that tell us? When Timothy was ordained by Paul, he got filled with the Holy Ghost. Why do we know that? Because he received through the laying on of hands the inner fire that is a gift of God. Now look back at John 14. My favorite chapter in the whole Bible, I would assume, I memorized it 40 years ago, 45 years ago, closer to 50 years ago. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now, this whole chapter was Jesus training his disciples in the Holy Spirit. Now, you say, that doesn't sound like it in the beginning. No, he started with a wedding analogy so they would understand. The Jewish weddings would be a contract where the bride and the bridegroom would be in contract. And then once the contract was made, we would call that engagement. And and it was an engagement period. But they weren't together. They were engaged or the contract was made. And now in our society, we break engagements all the time. But it was not, it was a contract. There was no breaking it once the contract was made. But they weren't physically together. And at that point then, and actually the parents would be the ones that would make the contract for the bride and the bridegroom, generally young. And then the bride would have to get ready and be trained by the family how to be a bride. She, her dress was made, her veil was made, her bridesmaids were chosen, and they put the wedding gown on, and all the attendants put their outfits on, and they wore them night and day. They never took them off because they didn't know when the bridegroom would come. So they never, ever were found not ready. So they put on the gown. She slept in the gown. She kept her makeup on. She kept her hair done. All of her attendees, too, all stayed ready for his coming. He went away and built the house. It was a a partition added on to his father's house, which is why this scripture makes so much sense. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I'm your bridegroom. If I go away, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. I'm not going to not come for you. I'm coming. In the meantime, I'm going to build a house for you. It's attached to my father's house, you see. And when the house is finished, the father, and that's the beautiful thing about the Jewish wedding, is the bridegroom's ready at the minute he gets up a wall, he's ready to go get the bride. But the father's watching And he's like, no, 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 you you need a bed. You need utensils. You you need a a roof. And so the father keeps telling him, do this, do this, do this, do this. And the father's not just watching the bridegroom and what he's doing. He's also in communication with the bride's family. And he's watching her preparation. Has she learned to cook yet? Is she going to be a good wife to my son? So she's being observed too. The father is the one watching. Now, Acts chapter 3 says heaven literally holds Jesus back. I can just see Jesus, can't you, as the bridegroom? And, and all the angels got him around the way saying, no, nope, not yet. No, no, you can't go get her yet. You can't get her yet. Mm-mm. But he's ready to come and get us. So don't think that the holdup is Jesus. The holdup is not Jesus, but Father's got his eye on the bride. 
who's not ready. And so he's watching us. If anybody is to blame that the Lord has not come yet, it is the bride's not ready. But the truth is, Father already has an absolute day because he knows everything. We are on this linear time, but Father's already been in our future. He knows exactly what day. And that day, we will be found ready because we're going to do what the rest of what he says to the disciples. If you skip on down to verse 12, he says, Verily, verily, the works that I do shall you do also in greater works than these, because I go unto my Father, ask anything in my name that the Father may be glorified through the Son. So he's telling them that once we become one, we're in contractual agreement as one. It's legal, cannot be broken. And everything that I have and everything that I am, you have it too. Every ability that I have, you have it. He said, the things that I do, you will do also. And greater works than these shall you do. Can you imagine? Can you even wrap your brain around us doing greater works than Jesus? But he told us over 2,000 years ago in his word that we would be. And yet I haven't seen a human being yet jump out and walk on the water. I haven't seen as many miracles as Jesus performed in just a few months. We, we're tapping, but we're not tapping all the way in. And it's because we don't understand the rest. When he says, I tell you, if, any, if anyone steadfastly believes in me, he himself will be able to do the things that I do. That is the most powerful statement. You are not weak. You are strong. Do you not believe that Jesus is strong? Jesus is strong. And what he does, he says, you can do also so that my father will be glorified. I will grant, will do for you whatever you ask in my name. Whatever you ask. Then he goes on, he says, if you really love me, you'll obey me. And that's the rub right there. That's why we don't do the works of Jesus. Because we have to be in such intimate relationship with the Spirit of God to be able to obey Him because He doesn't lay down a bunch of rules and regulations. He just fulfilled that with His coming and His crucifixion. He fulfilled the rules and the laws so that relationship would be the way from the cross forward, the depth of hearing His voice and obeying it the depth of walking in the Spirit of God and not having to have a bunch of rules, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. No, no. He's like, that's no relationship. I need you so close to me that if I look at you, you know what I want. <gasps> Harry and I have been married 37 years. We literally know when, when we take a look at each other what the other one wants. If you've been married long enough, you just start doing that. Now, I'm not saying you get it right all the time, but most of the time, I know when he wants me to shut up with just a look, <laughs> right? You get to that point where you're in relationship, and God wants us to get in such a point with him that we just feel a nudge, just a little, mm, and you know. And sometimes if you don't know what to do exactly, just stop and wait, and you'll know. And I've learned to say, do you want me to do? And he'll nudge again if he wants that. Because people say, I don't know the difference between me and the Holy Ghost. And I always laugh and say, there's a big difference between you and the Holy Ghost. It's called humanity. Pretty much humanity, everything we want benefits us. But the Holy Spirit, everything he wants benefits others. So many times, if you're not sure if it's you or the Holy Ghost, just check the benefactor. The benefactor, Whoever benefits, if it's others, it's usually the Holy Ghost. Now, he goes on to say now, and this is Jesus teaching, verse uh, 16, he said, I will ask Father, and he will give you 
another comforter. Now, I'm, I'm in the Amplified. He's a comforter, a counselor, a helper. He's your intercessor. He's your advocate. He's your strengthener, and he's your standby. Why would we not want that relationship? He is everything we will ever need. The Holy Spirit is everything. And then he goes to say that he may remain with you forever. So what Jesus was telling them and what we need to understand is Jesus himself is actually not with us on the earth. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. But he said, don't worry, I'm going to ask Father and he's going to send you the Holy Spirit. And he's going to remain with you forever. Now, you can see why the devil has stirred up churches across the world for 2,000 years to not come into agreement about the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is Jesus' representative, gift from Father to us. Jesus said, Father... Send them the Godhead, Holy Spirit. And Father said, he's on the way. And then the devil comes in, and he doesn't so much stir it up in the world, but he stirs it up in the church. Some believe in the Holy Spirit. Some believe that that the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2 but never came again. I'm like, there's no word for that. Absolutely no word, but the, you, the devil does not tell the truth. He lies. And then when we believe a lie, that lie becomes truth to us. The moment you believe a lie, you operate from that point on as if it's truth. I grew up in the Methodist church. I thank God for the Methodist church because it didn't teach me anything. It did teach me a couple of little. It taught me Jesus loves me. But it didn't teach me against anything. So when in 1974, I was introduced to the Holy Spirit in a Brother Kenneth Hagin meeting, I had no reservations. Now, there are other churches. Uh, I, I'm from the South. So the Baptist church in the South is a very strong denomination. And they're a wonderful group of people. Uh, I know a lot of Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Ghost Baptist people, so I'm not talking about the people. I'm just talking about the organization as a whole. Now they have had a massive split, by the way, over the Holy Ghost. But glory to God, you've got a group rising up inside of that group that says, wait a minute, the Holy Ghost is real. And the infilling of the Holy Ghost is real. And so when I was introduced to the Holy Spirit, at 17 years old, I went to a Brother Kenneth Hagin meeting because I needed to be healed. I'd had a short leg for six years. And it came from a car wreck when I was 11 years old. My back was broken. My left leg was crushed in 32 places. And I went through the windshield. Had a head injury and I had over 100 stitches in my face. That was at 11 years old. Doctors told me I'd never walk again. God did a miracle in my left leg. Because I had a word from God that I was holding on to. Five years old, the milkman told me every Tuesday, one day, little girl, you're going to be Miss America. One day, little girl, you're going to be Miss America. You, you might say, that's a word from God. That was a word from God that didn't even become active until doctors stood around my bed and said, you're never going to walk again. And I said, wait, I will walk again because I have to be Miss America for God. I will walk again. And the doctors kept coming. They sent my pastor to try to talk me out of it. They thought I was delusional. They thought I had a bad head injury. They sent my music teacher to try to convince me that I was going to be a cripple the rest of my life. But I had a word from God. So all the influential people in the world could not trump the sound of God's voice in my spirit. The Holy Spirit said, you will be Miss America for my glory. So guess what? I was Miss America for his glory. But there were years, and this is what I want you to understand when you walk with God. You cannot be moved by time. 
You cannot be moved. If it takes a period of time, you must stand your ground with the enemy. You must hold on to the word of God. And when they told me I could, would never walk again, I said, you are mistaken. I will walk for the glory of God. And over the next three months, a cocoon of calcium began to wrap 32 pulverized, fragmented pieces of bone. And at the end of three months, there was a new bone in my left leg that all the doctor wrote across my chart was miracle. Miracle. And I'll never forget when I was on Larry King years and years and years later... You have to be old enough to even remember now who Larry King was. But when I was on that show with him, my doctor got on the phone. And he told Larry King, he said, if she says it, it's true. She does not lie. And then he went on to say, I was there. The bone was pulverized. The top and the bottom of the leg touched from the knee to the top of the thigh. It was pulverized. There wasn't even pieces. It was just pulverized. But God put a new bone. And he said, I examined that bone, and it was stronger than any other bone in her body. It still is to this day. Stronger than any other bone in my body. And I was upright and walking within six months. Had to learn to walk again. But you learn, and you push, and the Holy Ghost helps you. And then six years later... I entered my first pageant, but I, was, I hadn't entered yet because my leg was still short by two inches. And so there were these Holy Ghost people in my county. We didn't have a Holy Ghost church. There was Holy Ghost people without a Holy Ghost church. Anybody understand what I'm saying? How blessed you are to have a Holy Ghost church. But these Holy Ghost people, God sent them to me. And they encouraged me that there was something else for me. And in reading the word and studying the word, I began to see what is God's will for me about healing. And I began to find all these healing scriptures that the Holy Spirit brought to my mind. And then I went to this Brother Kenneth Hagin meeting, and the altar call came, and I walked down to the front, and I lifted my hands, and I said, Lord, just give me anything and everything you want me to have. And the moment you open your spirit up like that, you better get ready for a flood of his presence. My left leg was healed immediately. It grew out to be the same length as my right. My back had been broken. That was healed. I had ulcers in my stomach. That was healed. Everything that was wrong with my body from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet was healed. And then I began to thank him and praise him in English. And I just ran out of words. I just couldn't come up with enough thankfulness in English. And so I just began to praise him. And I began to thank him in this language. Now, I'm a Methodist. I didn't know who the Holy Spirit is. But I said, give me anything and everything you want me to have. So he filled me with the Holy Spirit. And I still didn't know who the Holy Spirit is. I thought... I had to have a foreign language to go to college the next year. I thought he gave me a foreign language so I could go to college. I had no idea. I thought it might have been Spanish. I thought it might have been Italian. I didn't know what it was, and I didn't care. I had a foreign language. Now I can go to college. (laughs) And so I go back to my seat, and I sit down, and I'm seated with the two Baptists, two Methodists, and two Presbyterian that took me, all filled with the Holy Ghost. And so... Brother Hagin asked, does anybody want to be filled with the Holy Ghost? I'm thinking, like, if there's more, I want it. So I jumped up and tried to get across to get out so I could go receive the Holy Ghost. And my friend said to me, sit down. And I said, I couldn't come out of it. I was stuck in the Holy Ghost. And she said, sit down, sit down. And she was like, sit down. She said, honey, you have the Holy Ghost. That's the Holy Ghost. I was like, oh, I had no idea. So that's what I want you to understand, that whether you grew up in church, whether you grew up in Pentecost, whether you grew up in nothing, the Holy Spirit is for us. And God wants everyone to receive his gift. Now, as he goes on and he's teaching his disciples, he says to them, 
the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive or welcome or take to its heart because it does not see the Holy Spirit. It does not know the Holy Spirit and it does not recognize the Holy Spirit. But you know and recognize him for he lives with you and soon will be in you. And that's where so many people can't understand the difference between the Holy Spirit being with us. We can't even get saved without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit draws us to the cross, draws us to Jesus. So he's with us, but there's more. He wants to be in us. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead quickens your mortal flesh. The Holy Spirit causes your life, your body to be alive. Without the Spirit of God inside of us, we are nothing. We have nothing. We're just a shell. But we are privileged to house his presence. And Jesus said in John, I believe it is, um, look at John 20. I'm trying to give you a foundation. We may come back to John 14 of why the Holy Spirit has put this so strongly in my heart. John 20 <clears throat> Verses uh, 21 and 22. Jesus then said to the disciples, Peace to you. Just as the Father has sent me forth, so I am sending you. And having said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Cancel, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Actually, it just pulled up all this stuff about how to receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Even my watch wants to get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> receive the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus was about to leave. And one of the last things he says to the disciples, is receive the Holy Spirit. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to tarry for it. All we have to do is receive. He will not make anybody house him. We must willingly receive. And I don't know about you, but I've been filled with the Holy Ghost now since I was 17, since 1974. And I regularly just yield all over again. Just give me a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. Let me not take you for granted, Lord. Let me not take your presence for granted. I receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus made it so obvious that it's our responsibility to receive. And if we're not careful, we get so caught up in life that we forget that we house the very presence of God, that we forget that we are the very image of Holy Ghost to the world. We house his glory. When the angel said in Isaiah chapter 6, the whole earth is filled with his glory. They were actually looking into the future and seeing you and seeing you and seeing you and seeing you and seeing me fill with the glory of God. When we look at an external place looking for the glory, you're going to miss the glory of God. The glory of God is in you coming out. The glory of God is in me coming out. The only way the world will see the glory of God is when they see the glory of God in us. For we house Shekinah. The very glory of God is the expression of Holy Spirit. And he lives in us. 
So when people look at us, they should not see darkness. They should see light. 22, this year that we are in right now, that we are finishing up, 22 means the light and the glory of God. And there has been a definite dividing line between people that are housing darkness and people that are housing light. And what that should do is cause you to want to be even brighter. And the only way we can is when we do what Paul said to Timothy. You got to stir up the gift of God in you. You can't just have the Holy Spirit being an event that happened to you. It can't be a moment where you were filled with the Holy Spirit. It should be an eternal lifetime. He's with us forever. So what do we do? We pray in the Holy Ghost. We get out of our mind and we get into our spirit and we live from the spirit of God instead of living from what we think. We walk by faith and not by sight. What is that? That's the difference in being fully led, filled, walking in the spirit of God versus you're all about your logic and your thinking and what people say. I'm, I don't know about you, And and I'm not saying we should not be informed in the world, but I'm telling you, if you're not careful, you'll get so hung up on being informed that you'll actually think that an election can change things. I mean, how old are we, really? How many elections have there already been? Has anything ever changed? No, because people can't change anything. God changes things. It's the Spirit of God in people that bring about a change in a nation, a change in a community, a change in a state. It's the glory of God in people that brings so much light, the darkness has to flee. We forgot who we were. We forget who we house. It is not about us. It's about the glory of God in us coming forth. Shining out, sounding forth. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. Stop waiting for a feeling. The Holy Spirit isn't a feeling. He may fix your feelings, all right, but He's not a feeling. He's the Spirit of God. And when you don't feel like it, you pray in the Holy Ghost. And when you feel like it, you pray in the Holy Ghost. And when you're hurting, you pray in the Holy Ghost. And when all is well, you pray in the Holy Ghost. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do you resist him? I believe we're in a time and season where we must draw closer to Holy Spirit until Jesus comes. I felt compelled to write this new comprehensive book on Holy Spirit. You can get your copy, whether in ebook or regular book, from our website, SalemFamilyMinistries.org, or you can order from Amazon. I believe it is filled with revelation for you in these last days and will be a wonderful companion book for you to study along with your Bible each day. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Welcome.